go. Um, Regev, one of the things that has always puzzled me from all the videos that I've seen, that this attack happened, you know, somewhere around 6.30 in the morning. Were you, where was your emergency squad? Are they 24-7 walking around? Um, do you have cameras around? Do you what? Is there some, what alerted you, um, your emergency squad to get there um, and be the first responders against so, this? We do have cameras, but it's not like we have someone sitting and watching them 24-7. So there's a, there's a guard post overnight, but you know, it's one person that's supposed to patrol and, and watch the cameras. In reality, what happened is we had a camping that the same night on the 6th, we had a camping outside of the kibbutz, next to the kibbutz. And 6 in the morning, like you said, they were the biggest missile attack we ever saw. People understood that something is off. The moment there was a minute of quiet, everybody went into cars and tried to get into the kibbutz. On the way, the one of the emergency squad people was hearing gunfire. And he understood that he's being shot at. And then that's what got everyone out pretty early. But like you said, it was very early. We never expected it. The idea was that we would have a warning, but it never, it came, but it came a bit late when the warning came from the army in the end. So just because of this camping, we were outside, people were outside. And then he, he understood it was being fired on. He called everyone and he had regular people, right? right. It was a Saturday, it was a, it was a holiday, Rosh Hashanah. So right. people were at home. So we don't know what would have happened if it was the middle of the day sure. in a usual working day. How, how big, I mean, when you talk about emergency squad, do you also call them your first responders? They are the first responders. They are your yes. first responders. Yes. So how many people were twelve. part of that? Twelve. Well, and they held off a few dozen? There, there were twelve. We were lucky. There were another four soldiers there on a vacation. So these 16 people had held for three and a half hours, which is, again, extremely Incredible. capable of people. It's, it's incredible, yes, because the, the idea says that they're supposed to be there for a few minutes until the army will come to, to back them up. Not three and a half hours. And it took three and a half hours for your three and army, and a half hours. for the army to come. For the army. Um, let's move on a little bit. Why don't you tell me your story? Where were you? Where was your wife? Where were your children? So we, I woke up here in the mid side because we are so close. I'm here when, when they start launching. Them. Right. And there was no alarm. I was just here in the bomb. So I was here in the, the mid side and I woke my wife because she's, she's a bit scared of that. And I thought, uh, maybe you want to go to the shelter. I will come if there will be an alarm. 20 seconds later, there was an alarm. I was running to the shelter with her. We were sitting there and things kept on coming. She was very nervous saying, did we do something? What happened? Did they do something? And we, we honestly didn't understand what's going on. And then when we tried to log in, suddenly everything was off. We had no internet. TV was not working. Nothing was working. Until today, we, we got no answers what happened. We were totally cut off. And we were just sitting there waiting. And then, very quickly, I don't remember if it was even before 7 o'clock, I'm hearing gunfire. And I'm hearing me and a kalach. So I have some experience from the yeah, army. And, and I understand that this is a kalach. It's not an M16 even. It's not us. Somebody's right. shooting at us and it's really close by. So I went out of the shelter. I closed all the windows, all the doors, locked everything. And I tried to get a reception in the phone. I couldn't get anything. And, and then it sounded like there's a, far, there's a, a war going on outside. Right. It was scary. And, and I tried to keep them calm. So the, the girls woke up at some point and I was trying to act as if everything is normal. Keep them happy, smiling. and put them something on a tablet that I had that I downloaded in advance. We were flying a few weeks before. So I had things downloaded to the tablet. I was putting them on TV, calming my wife and then going outside to understand what's going on. At some point, I got a push of WhatsApp into the phone. And I understood it's when I'm going next to one of the windows. I just left the phone at some point there. And I'm getting a video of terrorists going around in, in a car and then somebody going around in, in the road. Just, just like That's that. When you realize. In broad daylight. And then I'm realizing something is really off. Uh, I took some knives. I put one on me. Uh, put them around the house. So I'll have them if I need them. Uh, I said I put a chair. I got two doors. So between them I got a concrete there so I just put a chair that I will be safe and I just got in the door for like an hour I didn't even move at that point my wife understood that something is off she said you're looking on edge you're never nervous something is off and I told her look there's gunfires it's really close I hear Kalach there something is really off 
right? And, and her family was really nervous. They thought, it's because you were not answering, I'm getting mails like, are you safe? Are you okay? What's going on? And we understood that things, bad things are happening. And I just put her in a shelter with the kids. And then at some point I got a push to WhatsApp that I can actually disassemble the, the door to the shelter. And that will keep us safe if they break in. So, and for me, like, I was just... Now the shelter's in your house? In my house. And, and you were in, in with your wife and your two children? I was from the shelter to the door, from the sh guard yeah. in the door. And then at some point, my wife had a brilliant idea. Let's put a monitor on the doors. And then I put the monitors on the doors. So I can cover both doors. And I was sitting in the shelter with a monitor. And then if we break in, my idea was, right, what can I do in this reaction? The best thing is to snatch a gun on when they're trying to come in, stab them, right. kick them, have a few steps. That's the best reaction I can have. So that's what I was trying to do at the beginning. And then I got a push to the WhatsApp saying, hey, you can disassemble the door, the handle to the door, and lock yourself in the shed. That would be the best approach. At that point, I didn't think what they did in Farhaza, they burned people alive. So I thought that's the best solution. Really, I went outside, I heard gunfire and everything. I was practically going very low, trying to get my tools. I got my tools, took the, the handle of the door out, and even tried with a plier to see if I can open it, and I couldn't. Then I brought all the tools inside so they can use it against me, locked it, and we were just locked there. And I was from time to time just going outside to see. And then 11 o'clock, few hours later and 11 o'clock I noticed that I'm seeing the army and I said look we're safe and at that point I, I let even the girls to go just to the bathroom and back stuff like that and at that point even when I heard gunfire I thought it's the army later I found out that it wasn't even the army it was still our emergency Your squad guys. fighting for us and, and they were alone again from your from your monitors and you know, yourself, did you see any terrorists? No, you didn't. So I see only army soldiers walking about around 11 when they did a sweep, and then later on there were a lot of them around four o'clock. The uh, kibbutz was full. They used it as a as, as a point to organize the forces. It's our point. Well, thanks, Regan. I mean, it's a really interesting story, and you know, I'm really happy for all of you guys, and what um, to be to all of you. Thanks, Regan. Um, just, you know, we were talking a little bit about your time on the, on the kibbutz, uh, Mikhail Sim. And I know that you've, you've been there, what, a year now? With, year, your, with right. your family, so you're a new member on the kibbutz. Mm -hmm. um, your wife came from Sterot. From Sterot. Sterot. And, and where were you from? Moshav Miftachim, it's called. It's like a small town, mostly agricultural farmers. Uh, there it's also next to the border, just in the south. It's closer to Egypt. Okay, so Mephal Sim, as far as I understand it, is very, very close to Gaza. Very How close to Gaza. 1.3 kilometers. Uh, that, that's, that's amazing. Prior to October the 7th, did you get a lot of uh, missiles coming over with a lot of sirens? There are always sirens, unfortunately, but I can't say a lot. We were living in the steroid before that, and the steroid were getting more yes. than us. And when we moved to Mephasim, it was a bit better. It's still, unfortunately, part of the day to day, right? You have an alarm, you know where to run, right. and you got only 10, 15 seconds, it's not much. So you're used to it, but we never imagined that this would happen. So our, our day to day was, or if we have an alarm, we're running to the right. shelter, we'll be safe, that's it. Right. So, you know, I mentioned before that uh, Mephasim is a real success story because you escaped um, the, the bad part of Hamas. But I hear that um, you guys um, killed 30 to 50 Hamas fighters that came to your kibbutz. Tell me the story of how you, 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 you guys managed to do it when all the other kibbutz like Kafar Aza and Bieri um, were just ravaged. It's a combination of things, I think. First, there's luck there. Uh, so we had a few meetings with the, the emergency squad, right? They are the ones that are supposed to defend the kibbutz and they're the first line of defense. And I talked with the person who was managing the, the emergency squad and honestly, he was extremely professional. Uh, most of our squads are coming from special forces in, in their past, so they were very professional as well. So first thing was their professionalism. Second, it was a lot of luck because what they did almost everywhere, they broke through the main gate and they insisted of breaking through the main gate. That was their, their orders that they got. And when they came to the main gate, there was some kind of a malfunction. We don't know exactly what happened until today. The gate would not open. 
and in Berry, for example, the gate were open, they exploded the kibbutz, and then it's almost mission impossible. When when our team saw that the gate, they stuck and they're fighting to open the gate, they had really like a, a long scrimmage, three and a half hours of fighting over the gate. At some point, they understood that we are really barricaded well and they were giving fire back to them and they blew up only a portion of the gate when they can come in. A few of them did succeed to come in and we got, we got them in the end. And after three and a half hours of fighting, which was a bit crazy, they were fighting over in the gate and in other places around the kibbutz. People were fighting from their living room. There's one guy who was fighting from his living room. You can see the house is, is full of bullets. He took, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of bullets. He shot more than 300 bullets there. And somehow he, he went out of it unscathed. Not all of them. We have a few injuries in the kibbutz, but that's it, injuries. That's the top. And after three and a half hours, uh, special forces from the, from the army, from the IDF came in and they helped them to clear those those 30 to 50 armed um, terrorists. You mean move the bodies? Not only the bodies, they or helped them to kill they, the rest of them. To kill the rest of them, the, the ones that we couldn't. Right. And really they cleared, at that point there was a stop in the fighting for a while. And we thought we were safe. I, I was at my home and I was always going to keep watch and around 11 o'clock I saw them patrolling in the kibbutz looking if everything is safe. And I said to my wife, hey, we're good. In retro, what I know what happened is they came in, cleared around the kibbutz, did a, a patrol inside, and told the, the people, our squad, look, this kibbutz are having it much worse than you. We have to go. And then they left us alone again. And this emergency squad were then guarding us, and they were, again, they were fighting more, three, four times again, they were trying. Nothing big like in the beginning. And then there's a lot of stories that we know only in retro that they were Another convoy coming our way, which was bombed later on by, by an unmanned uh, aircraft. Tell us the story of that, because that was really interesting when you told, told me the other day. So, as I said, we are very close to the border, and next to our, like, th there's the road, and after the road there's a small forest. And apparently they were using it as kind of some kind of an organization point. And there was a long convoy, five, six vehicles coming our way, and somebody noticed it from the Air Force, and there's a very strict rules when you're allowed to shoot inside of Israel. Right. Uh, there was such a mess, nobody was giving orders. And he just took the decision that he's allowed to shoot at them, and he just used his missiles to take the old convoy out. And most likely he saved our lives at that so, point. So, so he had a drone? He had a drone, and the drone just put five missiles on the, on the convoy, taking the old convoy out. We are talking about the, the big, cars with, with all the tourists uh, you know standing out there so definitely was a turning point for us you should get a medal I mean, that was pretty good there's a lot of medals to go around unfortunately. so, so um, first of all I think when you rename your gate to the kibbutz it should be called Hashem's gate <laughs> because um, you guys were saved and that's incredible um, did you have enough ammunition on you on the kibbutz not really, not really. We were more lucky than, I don't know if it's, if it's luck. So our emergency squad leader, he was very organized. And at some point, the army said, you're, you're, you don't need everything, right? You're being defended, everything is fine. And he insisted that people will have the gun on them, he will have the right ammunition. And we had a small bunker in the kibbutz. Not all of the people have that. Right. And when they needed more, they could go and bring more. But they were really low in the end, I know. So. Definitely for having me. Um, thank you for taking the time just to chat with me. Um, you know, with all the horror of what we've seen over, over the last few weeks, last few months, um, your your kibbutz, Mefal Kim, is is an absolute uh, beautiful success story um, for for what it endured. Do you want to tell me the story about how Mefal Kim was saved and just your role and a little bit about your family? Um, but first, first of all, I know that you're married, you've got two children, um, and a third one on the way. How old are your children? I got one, four and a half, the big one, yes. and almost three of them. Lovely. Little. Lovely. Uh, they're, they're beautiful, I've seen them. And then one in Lovely. the oven. Lovely, well, that's super. So tell, tell me about the kibbutz. How many people are on the kibbutz? Kibbutz is around 900 people. 900 people. Total. And most of them are kibbutz members. We are also members of the kibbutz. 
a lot of young people, there's also uh, an older community. And that's it, more or less. Now, the reason that, uh, before we get into it, the reason that you had to move um, to Hertzlea, to the coast here, is because the kibbutz has been closed down? Yes, the kibbutz has been closed down. During the 7th of October, we were attacked by around 30, 50 terrorists, and the army kind of took over the same night. They went in, they brought a lot of forces in, and we were asked to go out. It wasn't even a request, we were asked to go out. The last people that were still there, at the same, the next day, were put on a bus and were driven off to Natania in the beginning. And then from Natania we came here, everyone together. And how long have you been in this hotel? Since we've been in Natania for a few weeks, and since then here, so more than a month already here. And t tell me, um, just how has your family been and the people around you, how have they reacted to, to everything? I think the first two weeks, maybe let's say the first day it was total shock. Right. Our worst, worst scenario never... We'll, we'll get into that bit in a moment. That, but, so. but from the from the moving and everything subsequent... So the first two weeks people were in shock. Right. We kind of were just moving around. They put us in Natania, they were in a few hotels, we were spread all around. We were trying to get ourselves together, the kids and everything, and started to work even. I had a lot of pressure on working in a global role, so I had to work at some point. My wife took a week just to get herself together. And then at some point we moved from there to here, and we tried to get some kind of a, a rhythm, some kind of a routine here. Right? Right. So at some point we started to have that kindergarten back and, and something like a school for the kids. And over time, it got much better, but like you said, I think we're a success story because the kibbutz really took ownership. People from the kibbutz took leadership and they, they made things happen. I can't say that the state gave too much on that one. They, right. they are helping us economically, but to get in the, the what people need from the day to day, it's really people from the kibbutz took ownership and made sure that we'll have a kindergarten, that we'll have people here that is helping. Uh, We'll have the schools operating, we'll have even something to do in the evening. And now I can say that it's much better because we really have a routine, we have what to do. People started working again. Uh, we're still living in a room like a refugee, but the you know, conditions seen, are I've more seen, or less. I've seen your room. Okay, you've seen the room. It's, it's all of you living in there with the dog <laughs> and, and everything. But yeah. the good news is it's the first night of Karaka tonight. And I believe there's a party here, so it is. That, yeah. So that that bit um, is good. On a work, um, before we go to another segment, on a work point of view, okay. Um, I'm not going to mention your company just yet, but um, were they accommodating to you? They were. They were. I got calls from practically everyone, from top level everyone asking how I am, telling me to take the time that I need. Right. It's, it's more for me personally. Honestly, more relaxed if I know that I have everything in order instead of everything is a mess right. and I will be out for a few weeks. But they were very accommodating, they understood the situation. And I can mention fun. your company. Yes. Who do you work for? G, General Electric. General Electric, well, mm -hmm. thank you, General Electric, for looking after them. Um, 